So hi everyone and welcome to ABCs of Anesthesia. This is another special episode where I've got Nick, uh, one of our trainees from Perth, and I'm actually going to be asking him virus style questions um, about obstetrics in this episode. Uh, now, first of all, this episode we're going out on our podcast, ABCs of Anesthesia, as well as the YouTube channel, ABCs of Anesthesia. So uh, big hello to you, Nick. Uh, let, tell us a bit about yourself. Thanks for being on the program. I'm originally a UK trainee. Um, completed five years in the final FRCA back home um, and then came out initially for a year and have now jumped into ANSCA training. Um, I'm a AT2 slash PFY at the moment um, and just looking forward to getting these exams out of the way. Thank you very much for, uh, for all your courses, Lord Harry. Yeah, no worries at all. Hey, so you've already done a second part exam then? Yes. <laughs> it was... Uh, uh, probably seven, eight years ago now. So this is uh, a bit of deja vu. Yeah, wow. Hey, so you, you've done your second part in the UK. Were you practicing as a consultant there before coming here? No, I, I didn't finish the training program. I still had two years left to go. Okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, you saw how amazing Australia is and decided, yep, prefer the weather here. Oh, I'm currently in year seven of my anticipated one year stay. <laughs> I, I hear that a lot with uh, UK trainees. <laughs> Come for a bit of a look and uh, stay, stay, stay on. Well, that's good. So, Nick, um, why don't we get, get started? So, to, yeah, today's kind of topic, I'm just going to try and pack as much information about obstetrics as possible and give you, you know, the, obviously the opportunity to answer questions in a, in a virus style. So, let's get cracking. Um, it's a 30 year old G3P2 at 18 weeks for an emergency lap appendicectomy, laparoscopic appendicectomy. She's had two previous seizures under spinal anesthetic. She has no allergies, no relevant past history, uh, med medical or anesthetic. And she's obviously very concerned about the risk to her baby. Uh, and the question is, you know, what is your approach? Uh, so I'll give you a couple of minutes just to gather your thoughts like in the real exam. And then I'll, we'll get started. Okay, so this is a 30 week uh, lady, sorry, 30 year old lady who's uh, in her second trimester. Uh, who presents with appendicitis. Um, and there are multiple issues that need addressing. Um, first of all, I'd like to address the uh, maternal concerns for, uh, I'd like to establish exactly what these concerns are, um, particularly with regards to uh, whether uh, the risks to the baby and to the fetus. Um, other, I'd, I'd like to address the issues of the underlying pathology uh, which include the potential for sepsis um, and discuss the urgency and priority of the surgery. Yep. Uh, the fact that she's 18 weeks pregnant uh, has implications for uh, anesthesia, uh, including the position and uh, the presence of um, reflux, and therefore she's likely to require a, a rapid sequence induction. I'll stop uh, you. And the surgical concerns. That's all, that's all really good, actually. Um, so... At this point, she, she, she's really just worried. She doesn't care too much about the surgery. She's very worried about the baby. What do you tell her about? Uh, and she's not really sure, but she believes that there might be a risk to her baby. So, um, yeah, what do you tell her? Um, I think there are... It's really a question of um, positives and negatives and the risks of uh, undertaking the surgery. Um, I think that... If she's got an appendicitis, um, then that itself poses a risk to the um, to the baby, um, and that to have an anaesthetic or to undertake the operation provides uh, puts her at no increased risk over and above uh, the presence of the pathology itself. Mm. Um, so really, the best thing that we can do for her would be to to treat her adequately um, and. Yeah. Um, I think often in my experience, these um, ladies are concerned about issues of teratogenesis and the uh, potential effects on harm, uh, of harmful effects on the fetus. Um, we're beyond the period of organogenesis now, um, and there's no evidence that any of the routine drugs that I would use for this anaesthetic would cause any long-term uh, sequelae uh, to, the, to the unborn child. Yeah, sounds good. I like what you said there. So essentially, this is an emergency operation, regardless, the, you know, the mum's life is at risk, will ultimately be at risk, therefore the baby's life. So you really have to crack on. Um, then you mentioned teratogenicity. What, what other risk might you offer besides teratogenicity? Uh, the risk of uh, inducing spontaneous labour and, uh, and uh, mis miscarriage. Yeah, exactly. So really, 
this risk of teratogenicity and miscarriage specific to the specific to the um, uh, you know the surgery, the operative period, the anesthetic. Um, you mentioned organogenesis. When when does that stop or when does that decrease? When is that? Period? Uh, Period of organogenesis is primarily within the first trimester. Uh, I believe it's complete by uh, week 10. Yeah, good. For most of the organs, uh, day 15 to day 60. That's great. Um, do you have any large studies that show any safety or harm with teratogenicity? Not off the top of my head. No, that's fine. So apparently there's you know, large studies of populations of pregnant women to show no statistically significant differences in the rate of these abnormalities, congenital abnormalities, uh, in, in those um, babies who've had surgery during pregnancy compared with control. So that makes me feel very reassured and it's a good thing to be able to reassure, reassure your uh, patients with that. But I like what you said that, yeah, essentially there's no, most of the stuff we use is pretty safe. Um, how about miscarriage? What's the risk of that? Um, I, I don't think that the risk of miscarriage is increased over and above um, the the risk which is elevated by her having uh, this pathology of by her having an intra-abdominal sepsis. Yeah, that's, um, that seems a far higher risk, doesn't it? So they've got this overall 5.8% reported after surgery. So it's, it is higher, but that's after any surgery and you can't really avoid this happening anyway. Um, good. Let's talk about some of the anesthetic agents that you might use. Would, would, you, would you use nitrous? Um, no, I wouldn't use nitrous. Uh, I don't see that it has any particular benefit. Um, I think that it offers potential for complication with um, um, uh, thymine synthesis. Um, uh, sorry, I can't, I can't remember this. I can't remember the uh, the exact um, vitamin uh, that it uh, interferes. Uh, methionine synthetase. Um, That's right. And does it show any teratogenicity? Um, I don't think so, no. Apparently in animal studies, but yeah, otherwise, not, not, not that I've seen it. Not that I've seen. Um, how, how about uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories? Would you, would you use that? Um, I would, again, I would look to avoid using non-steroidals in this population. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. Yeah, some, uh, there is evidence of fetal loss in early pregnancy and premature ductus, closure of the ductus arterius in third trimester. Um, Okay, so when would you want to do this operation? Start the lab appendectomy. Uh, I think the timing of the operation needs to be discussed with uh, the surgeon as uh, to as to the urgency of it. Um, ideally, it should be performed within hours. Um, it should be a multidisciplinary uh, discussion between the obstetricians, the midwives, um, uh, general surgeons, and the anaesthetists, mm -hmm. uh, and ideally, it should be performed within hours. Within normal working hours. Sounds good. So, so sounds, let, let's say the surgeon says this patient is stable, you know, the hemodynamics is stable, but they've got appendicitis. When, when would you expect the surgery to happen? Um, Any time in the next six hours would be reasonable. Yeah, sounds good. How about if this was an elective operation, like it was a, a lap collie or something? When, when ideally would it be done? Say something was semi elective? Um, so if this was a lap coli, I think that would depend on whether this was um, an acute hot um, uh, cholecystitis or whether this was, say, for biliary colic. If this was for something like biliary colic, then ideally defer it until after pregnancy was completed. Yes. Um, if it was for uh, an acute septic um, episode, then again, uh, within that sort of six-hour time frame. If you, had a, if you had an operation that was semi-elective, it needed to be done at some stage during the pregnancy, but uh, you, you couldn't wait too long after, when would be an ideal time? The optimal time would be the second trimester. Yeah, sounds good. Why is that? Um, so it's the period uh, that after uh, organogenesis has uh, occurred um, and before um, the uh, before it uh, increases the risk of significantly inducing preterm labor. Um, so really it's, it's that safe window, almost the Goldilocks zone. Yeah, sounds good. Uh, so with the anaesthetic, you're, you're about to induce this patient. What do you, what do you do? What's your anaesthetic technique? Uh, so my goals of anesthesia for this lady are um, to prevent aortic cable compression, uh, to mitigate the risks of uh, aspiration, uh, and to provide hemodynamic stability and to maintain uteroplacental flow. 
bearing in mind that the placenta doesn't uh, auto-regulate. Um, so I would place her uh, in the left tilt. Uh, I would perform a, a rapid sequence induction uh, using a CMAC um, to improve first pass uh, success rate. Um, I would pre-medicate her with uh, medical clopamide and sodium citrate. Um, and uh, I would look to have a vasopressor infusion running to, um, uh, to mitigate the effects of uh, induced hypotension. Uh, I would aim to keep her blood pressure within 10% of her uh, baseline uh, blood pressure. Um, I think in terms of uh, pre and post operative care, I'd also like to get a fetal heart rate um, assessment beforehand and uh, post the operation as well. Sounds good. Um, aortic heaval compression, when, when are you worried about that? Um, typically it's uh, after 20 weeks. Yeah, sounds good. Um, okay, so the surgery is uneventful and she recovers normally. Um, and actually, just as a hypothetical, when should elective surgery occur? If you were, you know, if you had time, if you wanted to wait for after pregnancy, how long would you wait for elective surgery? I would wait a period of about six weeks. Yeah, exactly. Great. That's exactly what, what I would do as well. <laughs> so let's say now we fast forward uh, to the future. You're, you're called to assess this. So she's now on the labor ward. She's not progressing well and she may need an epidural. She's now... So she's 30 years old, as we know, G3P2, two previous Caesars, as just to remind everyone, no allergies, no past history, uh, medical or anesthetic past history that's relevant. Um, so you're, you go up to assess her. She's not progressing well. She may need an epidural. What do you want to know uh, for, on your assessment of this patient? Um, so I'd like to assess this patient from a... Um, but both in terms of her medical history, um, I'd like to assess her from her obstetric history. I'd like to know if she's had any complications of pregnancy, including preeclampsia, gestational diabetes. Um, sorry, just remind me of her gestation. Yeah, uh, so she, let's say she's at 39 weeks now. Okay, so she's, so she's a term lady. Um, I'd like to make an assessment of her airway. I'd like to make an assessment of her spine. Um, and... Uh, assuming that she's a low risk um, lady, um, then I would consent her for, uh, for an epidural. Mm -hmm. Anything else you want to know on, on assessment? Let's say you're worried about her going uh, for a cesarean because she's not progressing well. So you want to do both assessments? Uh, so so I'd want to make, I want to assess her airway. Um, mm -hmm. I'd, I'd want to establish IV access. Um, I'd want a full blood count, a uh, group and hold. Uh, should she, um, should she need a transfusion? Um, Anything else? Now, every time uh, I, every time uh, I placental, placental location. Fantastic. And uh, what do you want to know? Placental location. Uh, well, I think you said she had two previous cesareans. Yeah. Um, and I, I uh, my the concern same. is that I do the same thing. As soon as I, sorry, there's delays in there. <laughs> as soon as I hear two more previous seasons, I go, yep, I better know where this placenta is regardless, but especially in this case. Uh, and what, yeah, what are you most worried about? So, so my concern with this is whether she's got a disorder of placentation, uh, an accreta, or increase of accreta. Mm -hmm. um, having a cesarean section, uh, having two previous cesareans is um, uh, puts her at increased risk of this, uh, particularly if the placenta is uh, anterior and low. Yep. And what is the risk percent wise? Um, the risk, sorry, the risk of yeah, let's developing a, a, an accreta. Yeah. Some kind of adherent placental disorder. Let's say what's the risk with one previous Caesar, two, three, four, uh, when you've got, you know, a placenta. Sorry, no, no, no. No, that's right. It's, uh, do, do you know roughly what it is? Like, is it small? Is it large? Is it, um, my suspicion is that it would increase exponentially with every section. You're absolutely right. So for, you know, first, second, third, fourth, and even fifth, they've got data for that saying 3%, 11%, then jumps to 40 in the third, uh, for the third, um, after three cesareans, then 60, then 67. So it's, it's a pretty interesting jump there. Uh, but, you know, a definitely severe risk or very, you know, very high risk of this happening. Uh, good. So she, uh, so that's good. So that's what you want to know. Anything else? What, what else do you want to know about the group and hold? That might be relevant. Um, I want to know whether she's got any antibodies. Yeah, exactly. Why is that important? 
Um, well, she's she's already had two previous babies, uh, and she may have uh, had there may have been alloimmunization um, from those previous, uh, but she's also had surgery in this um, in this pregnancy, mm. um, and that may then in, impact what blood products she can receive uh, and her <laughs> risk of having a, a blood transfusion reaction. Exactly, and and then practically speaking, if you need to get blood and they've got minor antibodies, what's the implication of that? Um, that it would then take longer to get the blood, and particularly if she's got a condition such as uh, an accretor where she's hemorrhaging, um, that uh, you're then running the risk of uh, giving her uncross matched blood. Um, yeah, that's in, right. In, in, a, <laughs> in a hurry, and then you're managing a transfusion reaction as well as a hemorrhage. That's right. Have you been in that situation uh, of someone having antibodies needing to give blood? Um, I haven't, but it terrifies me. Yeah, I, I had this one case. Luckily, she wasn't bleeding, but we only had two units of blood in the whole of Australia, and uh, because of the you know atypicalness of the antibodies, and the patient was in recovery and um, was, was doing fine. And then I got a call saying, "Look, we need those two units for someone with a HB of fifty, with some chronic myeloid dysplastic syndrome up in Queensland." And they had to get me to give the okay that we wouldn't need blood in this patient. I thought, ah, yeah. She will. And she was looking very stable. Like this, the surgeons were completely happy with her. But it's just a weird call to make to send blood away that you may potentially need, uh, but someone else needs it. I mean, a hemoglobin is fifty. So, <laughs> uh, okay. So you do that assessment. Uh, the junior obs resident mentions her blood pressures have been quite high. What else do you want to know? Um, so th this is concerning for preeclampsia. Um, so I would look for other features uh, of preeclampsia, including the hematological, um, uh, respiratory, cardiac, uh, renal, uh, neurological um, uh, systems. Um, so I'd want a full plate, uh, full blood count for platelets. Uh, I'd want a, a calculation screen. Um, I would assess the patient for the presence of headaches. Um, uh, and uh, hyperreflexia. Mm -hmm. um, I would also like to uh, make an inquiry about right upper quadrant pain. Um, I would look for the features of pulmonary edema uh, and um, check renal function and uh, look for um, a peripheral edema. You mentioned cardiac signs of eclampsia or preeclampsia. What are those? Um, so hypertension itself is a feature of preeclampsia, but it can be divided into severe and um, less severe uh, preeclampsia. So That's a blood pressure of 160 on 110 is uh, uh, sufficient to make the diagnosis of severe preeclampsia. That's good. What, now, what is your definition of preeclampsia? Um, preeclampsia is a life-threatening condition unique to human pregnancy occurring after 20 weeks of gestation associated with hypertension, proteinuria, uh, and may be associated with other um, system dysfunction, um, as alluded to earlier. Mm -hmm. Yep. And is there anything else about the definition that's interesting? It, it, it has to resolve as well after three months? Have, have you okay, heard after, that? after delivery of the placenta. Uh, no, no. Uh, hypertension arising after 20 weeks gestation. So it's got this time frame, 20 weeks gestation with resolution by three months postpartum and then everything that you said. So it's, it's actually a retrospective diagnosis that we only suspect they've got preeclampsia, but the, diagno the formal diagnosis only occurs three months after uh, delivery. I thought, that was really, I thought that was really interesting about that. Anyway, so that, that's fine. Your eclampsia definition is good. So what do you wanna suggest about her preeclampsia management or what do you wanna do for her management? Say you're, you're discussing this with the OBS team. Um, so the priorities in this are uh, blood pressure control um, and prevention of ongoing seizures. Um, blood pressure control can be uh, managed pharmacologically with either oral or intravenous agents. Um, prevention of seizures is uh, related to uh, loading of magnesium four grams over 20 minutes uh, followed by an infusion um, and should therefore require um, monitoring of um, uh, reflexes um, hourly thereafter mm -hmm. uh, and potentially magnesium levels as well. Sounds good. Uh, so blood pressure control, let's talk about that. What, what are the agents that you'd commonly use to treat the blood pressure? 
So the oral agents that I've seen commonly used tend to be written up by the obstetricians, but um, libetalol is both the alpha and beta blocker uh, and can be administered in doses of uh, 100 milligram to 400 milligrams up to three times a day. The second line agents would also include um, nifedipine uh, and intravenous agents. I would uh, use uh, hydralazine at a dose of um, five milligrams intravenously, give it time to work. I would also look to use libetalol intravenously um, at a dose of uh, 10 to 20 milligrams and titrate uh, to achieve it. My target for blood pressure control would be to achieve a blood pressure of less than 140 on 90. Yep, sounds good. And how, I mean, what do you worry about when you're treating the blood pressure in preeclampsia, like as you're treating it? Is so that- the concerns are with hypertension and with hypotension. Um, with hypotension, my concern is um, too precipitous a drop uh, can um, uh, impair a fetal placental perfusion, given that the placenta can't auto-regulate. Um, but uh, the main risk with hypertension is uh, the risk of intracranial hemorrhage, and this is the most common reason why ladies with preeclampsia die. Okay. Uh, so do you have a blood pressure aim of how rapidly you want to, want to control this? Um, I think it depends upon the severity uh, that uh, a blood pressure in excess of uh, 200 should be controlled, should be brought down to less than 160 very quickly. Uh, Blood pressure of less than 160 is less urgent uh, and I would look to reduce it by um, 10 millimetres of mercury over, say, 20 minutes. Yeah, that's fair. Sounds good. You mentioned four grams infusion for seizure prophylaxis of magnesium. What, What infusion do you run after that? Uh, I then run an infusion at one gram an hour. Yeah, sounds good. And what is the evidence for this? Uh, The evidence for magnesium infusion comes from the MAGPIE trial, which was a multi-center, double-blind, randomized controlled trial. Uh, I think it enrolled over 20,000 patients. Uh, It was a multinational study, and it showed that uh, magnesium was the... um, uh, reduced the risk of... Uh, eclampsia following uh, preeclampsia. What's the NNT and like do you treat everyone with it and how effective is it? Um, the numbers needed to treat was, uh, sorry, so I can't remember off the top of my head, uh, no. but it was more effective in those with severe preeclampsia. So it had a lower numbers needed to treat for those with um, worsening uh, or higher blood pressures. Yeah, that's right. So NNT of 50 in severe, but only 100, the NNT of 100 in um, for mild preeclampsia. Yeah, that's good. Um, like, let's say the magnesium, let's say the patient was exib- exhibiting some hyperreflexia and the magnesium levels were high. How would you treat that? That's a, it's a very difficult question. <laughs> um, I, I think it depends on how high the magnesium levels are. Um, so at uh, normally we'd aim for a magnesium level of greater than two. Uh, above four, you start to get uh, deep tendon reflexes. So uh, I think if they were, sorry, you get to tend to get loss of deep tendon reflexes, but um, uh, I think with magnesium levels above five or six, we start to run the risk of uh, respiratory depression. Uh, so in the case of a, uh, a patient who's um, hyperreflexic, with high levels, I think I'd be aiming to have the, the magnesium levels less than five uh, so that they don't develop respiratory depression. Um, I'd be wanting to, uh, to treat the blood pressure uh, to ensure that that um, didn't cause any complications. Um, and uh, I'd monitor very carefully. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, you'd stop the infusion, you monitor carefully. Uh, and also you can treat with calcium, so giving 10% Calcium chloride can, can be worthwhile as well. Uh, have, have you ever had to give the mag- give magnesium, or it's usually what the obstet- obstetricians do, isn't it? Um, I, I have given magnesium, um, uh, but uh, but yes, it, it often is started by, by the obstetricians before we see them. Yeah, that's right. Uh, essentially, the patient now requests an epidural. Okay. Uh, as you attend to the patient, then what do you want to know on assessment? Everything else that you've done previously. Uh, so uh, let's say back when she first first came in, uh, it, there's no adherent placental disorder. There's no placenta previa. Placent, placentation is okay. Uh, group and hold is valid. No antibodies. You haven't seen the FBE results. 
uh, and she has no other issues with this pregnancy except the potential preeclampsia. Okay. Um, just like I haven't seen the full blood count results. If uh, if I suspect that she's got preeclampsia, then I would want to see those before I insert um, an epidural. Um, uh, if her platelets uh, were less than 100, I would also want to see a clotting uh, with that coagulation study. Yeah, sounds good. The platelets on, on return are 80. Uh, and uh, and you asked you ask for the coags, the coags are normal. Uh, what do you, what would you do? Um, with platelets of 80, I would um, insert and normal coagulation studies um, in a lady with preeclampsia where I think the epidural has potential benefits, I would insert the epidural for her. Um, how about if the platelets were 75, would you insert it then? Um, 75 is my cutoff. Um, so at 75, yes, I would. At 74, no, I would not. Okay, good. Have you, have you, have you been examined like this where people find out your cutoff and then push you uh, just across that line? Um, not before, no. <laughs> it, it was something that a lot of my examiners and or people that used to survive with me would do where they would go, oh, yep, so the platelets are 75. You go, yeah, I'll put the epidural. And they go, okay, the platelets are 74. What do you do now? Like, ooh. And, and the number of people that would just slowly go down further and further into the 70s and 60s just based on that one <laughs> increment. It's just a really interesting Viva technique. <laughs> that, that, that I, uh, I thought I'd just try and preempt it. And <laughs> <laughs> that's good. By saying 75 is my cutoff, and I wouldn't do 75, I thought that was a really good, uh, <laughs> good way of preempting it. Um, what do you say on consent for this, for this epidural? Um, so to consent the lady for an epidural, um, I would inform her about the risks and the benefits. I'd explain that uh, an epidural is probably the best form of analgesia that can be offered for um, a lady in labor. And that uh, particularly given that she has preeclampsia, that there are significant benefits both for lowering her blood pressure, uh, but also improving feto um, uh, placental supply and blood supply to the fetus. Uh, I'd also discuss with her the risks. I'd explain that uh, most likely thing is that um, about one in 30 epidurals need reciting because they either partially work, partially fail, or totally fail. And explain that there's um, about a one in 100 to one in 200 chance of a headache. Classically, it's the worst headache of their life and comes on about 24 hours later. I'd explain that the risk of nerve injury, which is what most ladies are concerned about, is um, pretty rare. It's in the order of about, and a nerve injury can be either temporary or permanent, and it can either be mild or it can be severe. Uh, chances of something temporary and mild is about one in 3,000, and the chances of uh, significant permanent disability, by which I mean paralysis, uh, is in the region of about one in 80 to about one in 150,000. Okay, good. Let's say... As, you, as you're starting to tell your consent, she just she just said, I don't want to hear it uh, because she's in so much pain. And at that point, what do you do? She doesn't want to hear the consent. Um, I would follow the guidelines for um, um, ANSCA um, about consent. And I would explain that I've tried to, uh, to consent to, for that. Um, and it's my typical practice that mention those risks uh, whilst I'm washing my hands. So I don't delay the procedure, but um, I state those effects such that if she's aware of, uh, if there's anything that I say that she wants to explore further, then she can do. Yeah, that's good. That sounds really reasonable. Um, okay, the epidural is working well. Uh, so it's gone in well, uh, and now it's 2 a.m. You went back to sleep, you got called up again, and you're now called for an urgent seizure in this patient. What do you do? Okay. Um, so it's 2 a.m. Um, I would go and see the patient. Um, I want to know what category of cesarean it is and what the indication uh, for, for the cesarean is. Let's say it's um, you know, bad decelerations, it's urgent, it's a cat one seizure. Uh, and um, yeah, it needs, needs to happen straight away. Okay. Um, so for a, for a category one a cesarean section at uh, two o'clock in the morning, um, I would... Uh, go and see the patient straight away. Um, and this is for fetal considerations. Um, I would make an assessment as to how the epidural has been working and I'll make an airway assessment as well. Um, classically, a category one cesarean section is uh, performed under general anaesthetic, but in this particular lady, I think she's at particularly high risk. And if her epidural's uh, sighted well and has been functioning well, uh, I believe a top up with 2% of uh, lignocaine and um, 
some sodium bicarbonate, sorry, 2% uh, lidocaine, 1 in 100,000 adrenaline, and 8.4% bicarbonate uh, can achieve anesthesia in almost the same amount of time. Um, so assuming that the epidural is working well, uh, then I would uh, proceed to top her epidural up en route to delivering her to theatre. Fantastic. Um, I'd be making... I'll stop you there for a second. So I just really like what you did with that as, as an examination technique for everyone listening. Um, you know, I gave you a situation and you told me the full story of that situation. You made some really important uh, statements and assumptions. You said, look, I'd check if it's working. And even though it's such an urgency and with her high risk, I'm going to make that judgment call already. So you're already con constructing a very reasonable story and you're offering a lot of information. And even that point where you said, so I would want to top up a top up with, and you mentioned the dose, 2% lignocaine uh, plus 30 biker plus adrenaline uh, for rapid onset and, you know, long lasting block. So you said it all in one sentence, which is really good. And you, know, you, you made correct assumptions. The way, the advantage of doing that, besides sounding like you know what you're doing, you've told a full story. It's far easier to get all of that in 30 seconds than the examiner prompting you and asking you for more information over that time. So even if the examiner wasn't gonna ask you one of those questions, you've already said everything and you sound good. And there's a certain subjectiveness to the marking scheme, I imagine. Therefore, that's a really good technique that you've employed there. So good work with that. Uh, what were you about to start on just before I interrupted you? Um, I was saying that this is an emergency, it's out of hours, so there are um, uh, considerations that need to be made for uh, allowing for the time of day that um, fatigue may be playing some parts. I think you, you mentioned that I had been in bed and had been asleep. No, um, uh, so I would uh, take her out, place her in the left lateral position. Um, I would start to make sure that I had a Let's say you, you do the epidural, um, you top up the epidural, everything's working well. By the way, it's a, a well working epidural. Uh, how do you check that it's working for well enough for surgery? What's your process there? Um, so I check for a motor block, are they able to move their legs? Um, I check with ice uh, to the level of T4. Um, and, One of those uh, things, right? Because uh, it, the block's been working with 0.2% repivacan, I imagine with a, you know, a adequate cold block for all this time. And so checking just cold isn't adequate. You really need to check the motor block as well and potentially light touch. So that's good. Uh, good, I'll, so moving on, uh, as, you're, as we're operating, uh, as, as the surgery progresses, the patient says she starts to feel some pain. Uh, what do you do? Um, so try and quantify what the pain is. Um, I think it's also relevant to the timing of the surgery. In my experience, the most common time for people to complain of pain during cesarean section is during the paracolic gutters uh, towards the end. Um, my technique uh, in this would be to, assuming that it's not the paracolic gutters and this is before the baby is out, um, then I'd just ask the surgeons to hold on for a second. Uh, I'd explain to the lady that um, uh, that she will get some feeling, she will get some sensation. And I try and quantify whether it is pain and sharp burning or whether it is actually just that sensation of stretching and pulling. Let's say the baby is out um, and you, you definitely, and it's definitely painful, it's quite distressing for her. Okay, um, so I would explain to her the options now are that we can either get, put something else down the epidural, I can give her something intravenously um, I could give her a little bit of uh, nitrous oxide, um, and uh, and I would, I would in, in reality, I think I would probably give her some nitrous oxide, and I'd give her a little bit of fentanyl, um, and I'd probably top up the, and I would top up the epidural as well with another five mils of my two percent mixture. Do you offer her GA? Um, I would do if uh, if it was ongoing. Um, I think I'd, I would suggest that at this point, as we're closing up. Uh, depending on how long the surgeons had left to go, um, I would um, explain to them, let's see if we can actually get through this. If we're just closing up the last few stitches on the skin, then I, I think a GA would be a little bit um, mm. uh, overkill. I, I think it's really situation dependent on the stage of the surgery, the amount of blood loss, uh, whether there's ongoing issues. Let's say uh, they're still closing the muscle layers, but they had already closed the uterus. Uh, would you offer a GA at that point? Um, I would offer her a GA, yes, at that point. Why is that? Um, 
I think it's her right to have a general anaesthetic if she's struggling, uh, but I would also tell her um, that there are things that I could do to avoid a general anaesthetic. Uh, and since we've gone through most of the operation without one, then um, uh, then it would be a shame for her to, <laughs> to go off to sleep right at the very end. Let's say she's happy not to have a general anaesthetic. Uh, actually, so I remember in our second part course, this was a number of years ago, one of the consultants was talking about the fact that there was a legal precedent for this, that uh, so, so, you know, a pregnant lady during cesarean felt pain, a GA wasn't offered, and there was a massive ruling, like you know, essentially litigation or settlement against that anesthetist. And the ruling at the end of that was that you have to offer a GA for any of these things. And I, I feel like that one case set a precedent for anesthetic practice in Australia where, you know, if anyone is in a, you know, either having a regional technique or some kind of non-general anesthetic technique, anytime they feel pain and it's safe to do so, I would always offer a GA no, no matter what, just because of, that, because of that like kind of legal precedent. Um, but I, I like you talking around that, you know, if it's just the skin that needs to be sutured, it'd be almost, it'd be very unusual to offer a GA at that point. Let's say she doesn't want the GA and you give some nitrous and fentanyl, that's not adequate. What else can you do? Um, I would, uh, bear in mind she's got an epidural that has been working well. I would put some uh, more of my 2% uh, local anesthetic mixture down that. That doesn't work, what do you do? So if we've, we've given her intravenous uh, fentanyl. She's yes. had some nitrous. Yes. Um, we've tried increasing the block height. Um, I think at that point, um, so, and again, sorry, remind me of what stage of surgery we're at. Let's see, muscle, muscle layers. Muscle layers. Um, you could ask the surgeons to inf infiltrate some local anaesthetic, potentially. Excellent. Yep, excellent. Uh, I'll do the same. And uh, often I'd add... Or, 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 or the general anaesthetic. Yeah, that's right. Often I'd add... I have had to do this in the past where I've added alfentanil kind of top-ups. as So, yeah, top up the epidural if that's the case. Give some nitrous gives them a Dazlam so they hopefully forget the whole experience, local in the skin, maybe even some alfentanil and maybe I've, I've once given small doses of ketamine as well. No, that's good. So that was really well done. I think we'll, we'll that's been 40 minutes, which is a, a good a, a good stint. Uh, how, how do you think you went? I, I think there was some holes in my knowledge. Uh, I think there were questions where I felt more confident um, and felt as though I had something to add. Um, yeah, I, I think you did really well. Like your, the way you're answering everything, it's it's quick and it's efficient, which I think is a, a reasonable part of this Viva to just get your ideas across, uh, you know, quickly and move through the Viva quickly, saying you know relatively correct things. You know, I'm I'm literally the way I'm constructing these Vivas is taking the latest latest articles and just trying to get as much information there so that it's useful for me, useful for you, useful for the audience as well. So, you know, the numbers that I'm quoting and stuff, I mean, a, a lot of us over time will just practice based on, you know, like kind of rules and, uh, and without knowing the exact numbers. So I think it's completely reasonable that you didn't know any specific numbers for some of them. <laughs> That's, you, know, it, what, you know, as if I'd know if I was put on the spot um, <laughs> with some of these numbers. Uh, Frustrating. I looked at the magpie trial at the weekend and I oh, completely forgot the numbers. <laughs> <laughs> Again, it, does it really matter to know the numbers, knowing that, first of all, obstetrics generally manages this and they're the experts in it, but also it's very helpful in severe. It's almost a requirement to manage with magnesium in severe preeclampsia, but mild preeclampsia, is, it's, you know, it's more touch and go probably. Um, good. Uh, and otherwise, just the just as a really good take home point, the way that you can move through a story of a you know move through the whole story of a question without needing to be prompted is a very fast and efficient way of getting through, offering doses, offering the full method, uh, just to give the whole clinical situation and making any relevant assumptions. Because then it's up to the examiner if your assumptions are wrong, like you were saying, it really depends on the stage of the surgery, uh, what I would exactly do. And so it's really up to the examiner then if they haven't mentioned it, say, oh yeah, we're at the skin or we're the baby's not out yet. So that was a, that's also a good technique. I'm assuming this, this is what I do. It's your framework. Excellent. Good. Let's, let's wrap it up there. So <laughs> thank you everyone for listening and watching. So there's ABCs of anesthesia uh, and yeah, please subscribe, please share with anyone who might be interested in this. And that we, you know, we really hope that you get some good information, good techniques and tips out of, out of what we're doing here. So thanks very much for listening and watching. See you next time.